So we have uh, the uh, last speaker of the evening, uh, Nicholas Merrill from, uh, wow, you must go back to the sort of like when the internet was sort of like wet behind the ears. A little bit, like, yeah. You no, know, the days of Archer and Go uh, Archie and Gopher and so true, on. True, true. You know, so true. Is, he's like me, he's old, he's old, the, well, old as the hills. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember that stuff and loved it. So uh, this is uh, Nicholas Merrill uh, from uh, Calix, which is, uh, dates from the very, very, very early days of the internet, uh, and uh, he will be uh, inviting you to do probably what you do already. So, I'm not quite sure. What, uh, anyway, so uh, yes, uh, Nic Nicholas Merrill on uh, the uh, constant surveillance and intrusion into our lives. Take it away, Nicholas. Big hand, please, for Nicholas Merrill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to begin by kind of apologizing in advance because when I speak about this topic, uh, I have to think a lot. The reason for that is that I've been under a gag order from the FBI for almost seven years now. Um, and whenever I speak about this subject, which is still a new experience for me, um, I have to stop and think to make sure that I don't say anything that violates the gag order. And there's about a million different ways I could screw up. And if I do screw up and I say something I'm not supposed to say, I could do about 10 years in prison. So forgive me uh, if it seems like I'm stuck for a second. It's because I'm going down a, a laundry list of things that I'm not supposed to say. Um, so in any case, the, the subject of my speech tonight is basically to tell you a story that, uh, that happened to me. Um, before I uh, really go into the story itself, I thought I'd give a little bit of background. Um, I started an internet company in 94 in New York. Um, you know, I was just out of school. Um, technically, I've been asked to leave school. Uh, but, uh, in any case, I, I was fresh out in the world and, and I thought, hey, this is a really exciting thing. Uh, it's like uh, the Wild West. There's no supervision, there's no, uh, you know, there's no rules. Uh, and that's kind of how it was at the beginning. And I, like most young people, wanted to change the world. Um, so, you know, being a, kind of a politically minded person, I wanted to work with alternative media, uh, I wanted to work with activists, uh, I wanted to do exciting things, and so I dove in and started to do that. Um, the company basically did a lot of things at the beginning, and later did fewer, but, you know, a lot of it involved web hosting, uh, providing internet access, things like that. Uh, it was all based on open source technology, uh, which was a really exciting thing. Um, number one, because it made it possible to do with almost no money, and number two, you know, you could really get your hands dirty, get in, mess with code. Uh, as time went on, I realized I wasn't going to be able to keep the thing going just by working with activists. I realized that that was not really as realistic of a plan as I thought at the beginning, and I started to do more what I call straight work, just working for uh, companies. And somehow I worked my way up to where I had some pretty decent uh, corporate clients who, in a way, ended up kind of subsidizing all the work with the activists, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, some of the uh, alternative media organizations that I worked with and some of the activist groups uh, were in, engaged in like really controversial speech. Uh, some of them did so anonymously, some of them used pseudonyms, and that aspect of it will, you know, the importance of that will become obvious later on in, in the story. Um, so then September 11th uh, happens. Uh, you know, that, that topic's been beaten to death, but, uh, but it sort of is important to this because uh, it sort of set the tone for me mentally in terms of uh, the offices 
that I worked out of uh, ended up being inside a closed military zone uh, where you had to go through military checkpoints to get inside and you had to show papers. And for me, that was actually kind of like emotionally jarring. Uh, there was weird stuff in the news. There was reports of mass roundups of Muslim men. Uh, and it just started to sound like stuff I knew from history. It sounded really scary. Uh, Bush started saying that he could just grab anyone, put a hood on their head, and just drag them away uh, just on his say so, uh, which you know, I found extremely alarming. Uh, and it seemed like the American public kind of had been terrorized by their own government to the point where everyone just kind of shut up and, and wasn't saying very much, and, and there wasn't a ton of protest going on. I, I kind of felt a bit alone uh, in my thoughts about how alarming this seemed. Um, this seems like it's uh, a tangent, but it's sort of more background information. Um, under U.S. law, we have the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. It's about searching and seizing things. Uh, the history of it was that the British used to run America as a colony. Uh, they had a, a paper called a writ of assistance, and it was like a blanket search warrant. Um, and when you go to school in America, you learn all about King George and how he was, you know, like a heavy-handed uh, dictatorial kind of a king, and uh, that led to the American Revolution. Um, so you have, just have to understand that this all helped create my, my worldview and a lot of Americans' worldview. Uh, so the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. Constitution guards, you know, people, their houses, their papers, their effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. And so there's always these scenes in movies where, you know, police knock and they say, hey, where, where's your warrant? And everyone knows these rules. Um, so soon after September 11th, uh, the Patriot Act passes in Congress. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I've seen photos of it. It was like hundreds of pages. It was a big stack of papers. But uh, the story that... Uh, that occurred was that you know someone introduced the bill, they brought it out, and within five minutes they had a vote and it was passed. And there was no debate, there was no discussion, uh, and, and it, it was something that really deserved like weeks of, of discussion. I mean, it was a huge thing. Uh, it turned out that there was a lot of really uh, heavy-handed things in there. There was uh, something called sneak and peek searches. Uh, those are searches where someone breaks into your house when you're not there, looks maybe take stuff, maybe not, and then they never notify you. Uh, so that was really kind of bizarre. That made me a little uh, nervous. Um, then they took this really obscure thing called the National Security Letter, and they modified the rules for it. And it had been used for a very specific purpose before, but uh, after they uh, modified the law, it became used for just general purposes. It had been designed for use against foreign agents, like spies and stuff like that. Uh, so it had a very narrow purpose, and then all of a sudden it was used for everything. Uh, and they also came up with something called a roving wiretap, which means that, uh, let's say you have 10 cell phones, they would just you know, get one wiretap order for you, for Joe, whoever, you know, and then they'd be able to follow you wherever you went. Um, so, you know, one day I'm working in my office, uh, it's a normal day, I get this telephone call. Uh, the telephone, the person on the telephone says they're with the FBI, uh, and they say they are sending someone to my office with a letter. I'm not really sure whether to take them seriously or not. I kind of half did and half didn't, but I have a lot of friends that, that do stuff like that, like call up, and, and, and so I thought maybe it was one of my friends. So I just kind of didn't think about it that much. I went back to work. But then, you know, uh, pretty soon, there was a knock at the door. Um, by the way, this is an actual image of the business card that uh, this person gave me. Um, now, this gets into this stuff that I'm not supposed to talk about a lot, because for some reason, I'm not supposed to really say basically anything about the agent that came. Um, you know, I understand. I guess they, they're protective of the agent. Uh, but I always have to call the agent the agent because if I say the sex of the agent, that apparently is enough to send me to jail, or if I say the name of the agent, or if I say what office of the FBI the agent came from. Those are all things I, I'm not supposed to talk about, so uh, forgive me if I refer to the agent as it, or something strange like that. Um, so the agent standing there, the agent pulls out a letter, gives the letter to me, I open the letter, I read it. Um, the letter says that I have to produce all kinds of 
data and information about one of Calix's clients. Um, I can't discuss exactly what they wanted uh, because of the gag order. Um, so this is an actual image of the letter, uh, but it's a you know, redacted version because if I show you the real one, then I'll go to jail for 10 years. Um, so the first thing that really leaps out is that it says that I'm prohibited from telling any person about this request. Um, I'm not supposed to mention that the FBI requested information, or I'm not supposed to talk about any of the details involving it. And it, it, it's just uh, absolute. It doesn't say, like, don't tell anyone for two weeks, or don't tell anyone until we get back to you and say you can't. It just don't tell anyone. That's, it's just absolute. It's not signed by a judge. That was the first thing I looked for. I'm like, OK, where's the judge's signature? Where's the stamp from the court? And it's not there. So I look up at the agent, uh, and I say, prohibited from telling any person, what, like, what about my lawyer, what about my business partners, like, wh what is this? And then the agent just kind of shrugged and didn't really answer me and acted like, uh, like it had no, um, no say-so and, and was just a messenger. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think I had to initial something. The agent leaves. Um, and then I go hit the web, and, I, and I'm trying to figure out what is this, because it specifies some like, executive order, and it specifies some part of the US code, and I'm looking it up, and I can't figure out what it means. So uh, you know, it, it says something about how uh, records are uh, being demanded in terms of either terrorism or clandestine intelligence activities. Uh, and you know, my clients were really not in that kind of a scene, so this seemed kind of ludicrous to me, just on the surface. Um, so in any case, the, the letter goes on, and it's, it's really heavy-handed in every way. I mean, it tells me that uh, I should never contact them by telephone, I should never send anything to them in the mail, uh, I can only do things in person. Um, and already, from reading this, I'm, I'm like really concerned about the legitimacy of this uh, request, and I, and I kind of felt like they were maybe uh, going after this client of mine for political speech. Um, so on the last page of the letter, uh, which you see up there, uh, I mean, mainly you see black marks, but the, there's a list. It's like a, a laundry list of information that they want. Um, there's 16 categories, uh, which I guess you can see that they, they didn't redact those dashes, so you can count that there's 16, so that's nice. Um, uh, and I can, I can tell you like the little things that are unredacted, like name, you know, account number, address, telephone number, email accounts associated with it, that kind of stuff. But all the other stuff I can't talk about. Uh, and the, uh, the FBI is very insistent that this information not become public. They, they, we had entire court uh, sessions just about that. Um, so, uh, in any case, at the end, there's, there's sort of a catch-all phrase which says, any other information which you consider to be an electronic communications transactional record. Now, if you think about the kind of logs that you have on a, on a server, um, uh, you know, that, that really is, is quite a lot of information. Um, so what, what do I do? You know, this, this is pretty confusing. Uh, the, the first thought I had is, like, no matter what this letter commands me to do, I know that I have the right to a lawyer, so I call my lawyer. I immediately disobeyed the letter, uh, like within five minutes. Um, you know, it was kind of lucky for me that I was already kind of involved with civil liberties and stuff, and one of my clients was the New York Civil Liberties Union, which is sort of a division of the American Civil Liberties Union which is sort of the preeminent uh, organization that fights for people's civil rights in America. Um, my lawyer, personal lawyer, says to me that he, he thinks it's completely unconstitutional. Uh, it seems ludicrous to him. Uh, he comes with me. We go to the NYCLU. Uh, they look at it. They're like, uh, they call the ACLU. The lawyers come down from ACLU, and they all look at it, and they all seem to agree that this seems totally unconstitutional. I mean, where's the judge's signature? What's with this lifelong gag stuff? Um, ACLU has never seen one of these letters before. Um, and that kind of scared me. Uh, I was like, what, what have I gotten myself into? Um, 
So ACLU goes and does some research with their own time. Uh, eventually, after having some discussions, they decide that they agree with me and my lawyer that they think this is unconstitutional, uh, and they offer to represent me. Um, so ACLU says, look, we, we would like to file a challenge in court, but, you know, we have to warn you that you are opening up a whole can of worms. I mean, you're, you know, it's, you understand what's going on. People are, there's like fear, there's hysteria, and everyone's like falling in line and, and, and you know, following the president. And, uh, you know, I hate to even refer to Bush as the president, but um, in any case, um, you know, they warned me like about how, how there could be repercussions from this and how, you know, it's starting a lot of trouble. And then I started thinking about it, you know, how recently they had been just kind of snatching people and th there had been this guy in Chicago, they just literally snatched him in the airport. They claimed he had been to like Pakistan and he had done some training and they just threw him in jail for years with no charge. And I said, well, how do I know they're not going to do that to me if we file this? And they said, well, we don't. And that was kind of the moment of truth, uh, where I said, okay, I mean, what else can we do? You know, let's do it. And so we went ahead with it. Um, <laughs> so this resulted in the first ever legal challenge to national security letters. Um, now, ACLU is trying to figure out how to even file the lawsuit, just technically. You know, they do all kinds of things that are routine to them, but this is like all new, uncharted territory for them. Uh, it turns out that they have to file it under seal, which means that uh, it's not put on the public docket, it's not uh, on the schedule of the court, it's not, none of the documents are online, etc. It's just sort of secret. So for a few weeks, nobody knows that it's been filed except uh, my lawyers and me and I suppose someone at the government that they probably notified. Um, finally, uh, they did unseal it, but that's when everything started being blacked out. Um, so because of the secrecy and, and the gag orders, uh, you know, I'm unable to even go to court. Uh, my lawyers go to court, but it's kind of like, um, I mean, it's a, it's a bad analogy, but it's like trial by in absentia, but it's not I mean, that's a bad analogy because I was the plaintiff and the government was the defendant, so they were sort of more on trial than me. But in any case, it was a very bizarre thing uh, just to hear the story of what happened later. Um, so we go to court and we get this really great judge. And this judge uh, declares the whole national security letters uh, portion of the Patriot Act to be unconstitutional. So it was like, you know, victory, like I was like really excited. It seemed like uh, we won, this was so amazing. And this happened really quick, like just in a few months. This was, uh, this is actually not the right article. This one's from 2007 because it was struck down twice, but whatever, I, I put the wrong image in there. Uh, so forget the date on that. Um, so in any case, then the other shoe drops. Uh, the government doesn't accept that they lost. They decide they're going to appeal. So now the, uh, judge stays his decision, which means that he told them they could no longer issue national security letters, but he, he says, I'm staying my decision, that means that they could keep issuing them. Uh, so uh, then, meanwhile, the U.S. Congress, you know, immediately hears that it's been declared unconstitutional, and they start working on, uh, you know, doing an amendment to the law to try to bring it more into alignment with the Constitution. Uh, eventually, it does change the law. Um, in a couple of ways that directly were related to my complaint um, in terms of the gag order in particular. Um, but at the same time, it also makes the gag order a bit more oppressive because now it carries a 10-year prison sentence if you violate it, whereas before, in the first draft of the law, it was just completely unspecified what the penalty was, which in a way is a little more scary. Um, so in any case, uh, the judge agrees that the NSLs are unconstitutional. He writes these, like, this really inspiring decision. He says, you know, democracy abhors secrecy, and he seems like he's totally on our side, and, and everything seems great, and I was you know, really on a high. I was happy. Um, and then meanwhile, right at this time, this is unbeknownst to me at the time, these librarians in Connecticut also get a national security letter 
um, asking for information on some library patrons and uh, things they had done in the library. Uh, they go on Google, they read about the judge declaring it unconstitutional, and they decide that, uh, that they have to resist, and they, they decide that they're going to go to court too, so they call the ACLU. Um, I only found out about this uh, after I was ungagged, which was just a couple of months ago, when the librarians finally got in touch with me. Uh, because there was no way for them to do so before, but they told me they are, weren't sure if they would have gone through with it were it not for them reading this article, which gave them the confidence to kind of charge forward. Um, so at that point, uh, since the government had appealed, we go up to the next level of court, um, which is the appeals court. Uh, but it, all this procedural stuff, I start to learn about procedure and how it can be manipulated to drag things out or to send you down a, you know, a wild goose chase. Um, what happens is, uh, you know, the, uh, we, get to, we finally get to court, and this takes months, and I learn about all this stuff like, oh, the judge is on vacation for two months, so we have to wait, and then uh, they, they have all these cases, and so we wait months and months and months, and you know, all of a sudden it's 2006, it's been a couple of years already. Uh, by the time we get to the court, Congress has changed the law. They've added like three or four words, and so the, the, the judges, it's like a now three-judge panel says that the case is moot, the law, the law that you sued for is no longer there, now there's this new law, now go back to the beginning and go ask the first judge about this new law. So uh, now, you know, a whole year and a half passes before we finally get to the lower court again. Uh, when I say we, I mean my lawyers, because again, I can't go to the court. Um, and this judge, who is, I think, a good judge, in my humble opinion, <laughs> um, again strikes down the national security letter provision in, in the new version of the law, because it's really not substantially different. Um, so now we get back to this procedural stuff. What happened at this point was the FBI dropped the actual demand for information. They decided they no longer needed or wanted the information that they had originally demanded. Um, I guess it would have been pretty stale by this time because it's you know, several years later. Um, so, but what this means is that I no longer have standing to even uh, challenge uh, the search because they're no longer asking for this information. Uh, that to me was really crushing because what I really wanted was to have that part struck down. I mean, the judge agreed that that was unconstitutional, uh, and simply by doing this little trick, uh, they were able to just make it, it was like judo, like all of a sudden now I can't fight it, but everyone agrees that it's wrong, but it, it continues. Um, so in any case, they also did this trick to the librarians and to the guy who runs the internet archive, archive.org. In all those cases, they withdrew the request for information once they had challenged it, once they realized that they weren't uh, patsies that were going to roll over. And it was only the three of us, as far as I know, who ever challenged it. Um, so at this point, in, in, in my case, um, I'm only now fighting about uh, First Amendment stuff and free speech and this lifelong gag order. Um, so, you know, now moving forward, now it's December 08. Uh, we are back at the uh, appeals court, the second level court again, um, because the government again didn't like that they lost and they tried to appeal. And when they get to appeals court, they uphold the decision again. So I win again. Um, and they, but, but now we're not fighting over the actual search anymore. Now it's just a First Amendment issue having to do with speech and, and whether you can be gagged forever with this open-ended gag. Um, so now comes like a really weird part where the government justifies the gag order using secret evidence. They, they get some evidence and they bring it into the judge's chambers and they show it to the judge and only the judge gets to see it. My lawyers don't get to see the evidence. So we really can't challenge it in any substantial way. And uh, my lawyers argue and argue and argue over this and in the end the only uh, bone that the judge threw us was that he made the government release some type of a summary of, of what it says basically but when you read the summary and you can actually read all the documents and this summary and everything on the ACLU's website um, 
it really says nothing. It's like it's so generic that you don't, you still, you get no understanding of what, what it might, might have said. Um, so I, I'm totally clueless as to what that might have been. I, I'd be speculating if I even guessed. Um, but one thing that, that they did say out in the open was that they claimed that releasing that third page of the national security letter, which lists all the types of information that they wanted to know, might result in a danger to the national security of the United States. I really thought that that was pretty ridiculous because, I mean, I know what's in it. I mean, I guess I'm just asking you to just trust me when I say that it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> In any case, the, the judge allowed them to introduce the secret evidence despite uh, arguing over it for, for weeks and months. Um, the FBI also claimed that disclosing what information they were looking for could somehow tip off the target and other individuals were under investigation and I guess change, get them to change their habits or something like that. Um, Again, this, I run up into the gag here, but uh, I, I, I have reason to believe that that is completely false. But I can't tell you why because of the gag order. Um, so it's, at some point I started to feel like, you know, I was running up against the law of diminishing returns um, because no longer was the case, no longer was uh, it possible that the case would affect everyone and set a precedent that would affect, you know, everyone who is subject to the law. But we were just arguing about me and whether I could talk and stuff like that. And meanwhile, you know, it's, it's into uh, 2008, 2009, and you know, I've been dealing with this mental stress of, of uh, making sure I don't tell anyone, and people are talking about this all the time, and, you know, uh, and I have to like, turn my back or go away or excuse myself when people are talking about it, and, and I've been warned not to sound like I know too much about the subject, and you know, it, just the pressure of it got to be too much, and I felt like I, I, I'm not going to change the world, I'm not going to change the law, so uh, then, you know, the end of 2008, my father dies, and, you know, I had never gotten to tell him about this, uh, and that really mess, messed the whole thing up for me. And uh, so at that point, uh, after a discussion with my lawyers, uh, we threatened to appeal again and drag it out for, like, as many years as, as they wanted to drag it out for, uh, unless they just let me out of the gag, at least somewhat. Um, and much to my surprise, this was you know, after Obama was in office. Much to my surprise, they, they actually uh, said yes, uh, but with uh, a huge bunch of caveats. Um, so, you know, just a few months ago in August, uh, they, the government and my lawyers actually reached some type of an agreement. Uh, and the terms of the agreement is basically that I can say that I received a national security letter. Uh, I can you know, talk about it in generic terms. Um, I can say I was the plaintiff in this case. Uh, and that's basically it. And I can talk about anything that's in the documents that's not redacted. Um, but uh, I'm trying to see if I have one here. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I don't have the right one open. Well, in any case, I was going to show a document, but uh, I don't have it open right now, so I would say just go look at them on the ACLU site. I mean, there's, there's documents where you, you go through 20 pages, and there's like, in all 20 pages, there's like 10 words, and the whole rest of it is blacked out. Um, this is the national security letter. I mean, they, this is very lightly redacted compared to most of them. Um, so in any case, the, the uh, the court case lasted so long that, that there were four different attorney generals during that time. Uh, the case was originally called uh, Doe versus Ashcroft, then it was Doe versus Mukasey, then it was Doe versus Gonzalez, and finally it was Doe versus Holder, who's Obama's uh, attorney general. Um, the gag for me was extremely frustrating on a number of levels, um, particularly in 2005 when there was debate going on about should uh, Congress renew the Patriot Act. And the FBI was testifying before Congress and uh, they were making it sound like it was awesome and, and they, they had stopped all these things and, and no one had stepped up and complained about it. And that was when I was like pulling my hair out like, yeah, of course no one complained about it because, you know, hundreds of thousands of them have gone out and every person that received one is gagged. So, yeah, it was really, it was kind of ridiculous, but, but somehow Congress bought that. Uh, and then they did, they did renew it all. 
Um, so I really would have loved to have gone and testified before Congress, uh, which I think may have been possible. I, I would love to have organized, you know, some resistance among the ISP community, but I couldn't do that, and that really frustrated me. Um, and you know, most of all, it caused me to be a liar uh, to all the people closest to me. I mean, I lived uh, with a woman at that point, and uh, she. Uh, you know, I had to hide everything from her. I had all these stacks of documents with black marks all over it, and I had to like hide everything. I couldn't hide it in my office because there was people there who could find it. And so I chose to hide it at home, or at least it was just one person that could find it. But I, you know, I had to like literally put things under lock and key and be all secretive. And you know, I, I consider lying by omission lying. And and so you know, I'm like lying to everyone I know, to to my parents, to my friends, to my colleagues, to my clients. And and I really took and take, you know, business relationships seriously. I don't want to lie to people and, you know, this kind of a, a gag order forces you to be a liar. Uh, so if you're, if you consider yourself an ethical person, that, that's a huge problem. Um, so, you know, before this all happened, I'd been really outspoken on, on the issue of the Patriot Act and I thought it was a horrible thing and then all of a sudden, like, I was really, like, tight-lipped about it and didn't really say too much. And so it really kind of squashed my, my right to just talk about politics and to just speak my mind and, and express myself um, out of fear that you know, I would say something uh, that would get me in trouble. Um, the results of the case, you know, this is like the, the good stuff. Um, the media really paid attention to it. Uh, there, were, there were some cool uh, writers at the New York Times. Uh, there was people at the Washington Post that were really nice. The Washington Post let me write uh, an op-ed article anonymously uh, as John Doe, which is actually against their ethical rules. They don't allow anonymous op-eds, uh, but they made an exception in this case because they talked to my lawyers and they verified all the facts and then they read all the court papers and they were satisfied that this was legit and there was no legal way for me to speak. So that was kind of huge. Um, then, you know, these other national security letter recipients came forward. Uh, at least the librarians told me they weren't sure they would have done it were it not for knowing about this uh, case before them. Um, you know, I don't know about the Internet Archive guy. I've never spoken to him. Um, when Congress got involved and they started rewriting the laws and looking at, uh, you know, the problems with it, uh, that I guess they hadn't noticed in, in the five minutes between when they introduced the law and when they voted on it, um, they called the FBI, the head of the FBI, to come in and testify and explain to them, you know, and, and justify what they'd been doing and explain what had been happening. Uh, so all of a sudden they were kind of in trouble. Um, and they uh, had been reporting to Congress after that on how they were using these letters and how many of them they were issuing. Um, now, right around that time, uh, EFF and ACLU started uh, filing all these Freedom of Information Act requests, and they started getting information on it. And right away, it showed that all the information that the FBI had been giving to Congress was false. They had been underreporting how many of these letters had been going out. Um, what they had reported, one of the numbers they had reported, was that between 90, f no, no, 2003 and 2006, they had given out something like 200,000 of these letters. Um, but, they, but remember, they had underreported. So that sounds like a lot, but it was more. It was at least 20% more. At least that's what they admitted uh, fudging the numbers by. Um, but in any case, you know, every time this kind of stuff happened, it became front page news. Uh, and you know, it, it exposed wrongdoing. So that is something. Um, the law did change. I mean, it's somewhat for the better. Uh, it's sort of like a, a booby prize because some of the uh, things that, uh, that we won are uh, things that I believe we already had. Like, you know, we won the right to talk to a lawyer, but it's like, but we already have that, you know, that's not, you can't win that. But that's one of the things that's now written in the law and that, you know, you have the right to challenge the gag, uh, but I don't think that's right either because that's prior restraint. They should have to justify it first, I think. Um, the other thing is that the public now knows about the abuses, the public knows about national security letters, so at the very least there's, you know, a whole consciousness thing going on. Um, I think probably anyone, particularly people from America, know all about it who are involved with the internet, but I think people all over the world seem to be familiar with the Patriot Act and the abuses and the stories. 
Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, ACLU gave uh, an award to me and to the librarians in 2007. Uh, they give an award out every year to someone who did something extraordinary for civil liberties, and that was really cool. Um, but unfortunately, because of the gag order, I couldn't go to the award ceremony, and I couldn't actually get the award because they would have had to have written my name on it, and then someone would have known, and so, so I didn't actually get to go, and I didn't actually get the award, but, but, but like on paper I did. So that was kind of cool. So they had a, they had a whole ceremony where they, they put an empty chair on the stage, and then they put like a spotlight on it, and then they read a statement that I wrote, but they had someone else do it with, uh, it was like a voiceover actor like read my statement so that it wouldn't be my voice so no one would know it was me. It was really, I mean, it gets into really Kafkaesque, weird situations. Um, but that's a good thing. Um, at, at, after all this stuff came out about the FBI, uh, a lot more mistakes, so to speak, came out. Uh, the FBI claimed it was all mistaken, but they were doing stuff like uh, going to phone companies and internet providers and giving them basically like, you know, something written on a post-it note that would say like, I owe you one national security letter. Uh, just give me all the info now and I'll come back next week with the letter, I promise. And, you know, and it, it's, it's, it was so bizarre to me because I thought like, you already have the right to just write your own warrant without going to a judge. Why don't you just make one? But they didn't. They were, they were doing these things which they called exigency letters. And then a lot of the time, they were apparently not even coming back later with the national security letter. They, were, they just leave them this IOU, which means nothing and has no legal weight. Um, and, you know, a lot of the phone companies were just going along with that. They were just giving them all the information they wanted. But uh, at some point now, the head of the FBI had to go and testify in front of Congress, and, and all the people were screaming at him. They were just, and Republicans were screaming at him. And I found that really satisfying. I mean, you have to take what you, have to take what you can get at this point, you know, because I, I didn't really win the way I wanted, but, you know, you just have to take the crumbs. Um, so, in any case, uh, the conclusions that I came to um, are really that, and, and, and I was a pretty cynical person at the beginning of this whole thing, uh, I really realized that one person standing up and uh, causing trouble can have like a snowball effect and it really can uh, set precedents that affect everyone. And I didn't really have that much faith in the system, and, and in a way, this sort of did validate that belief of mine, but in other ways, it sort of made me realize that there is a point. Because I remember thinking at the beginning of this whole legal episode that, that it was not going to go anywhere and it was not going to accomplish anything. Um, but it, it did. Um, but one of the real conclusions from this is like, this battle is far from over. And, and I'm not even getting into the overall issue of privacy and spying. Even just the national security letter battle is far from over. Um, and basically further challenges are, are necessary. Um, and if, if they sent out 200,000 of them between 2003 and 2006, you know, I, I wonder what the total number is and how many people out there have gotten them and why haven't any of these people come forward? I find that really disappointing. I mean, I'm trying not to be too harsh because uh, it's easy to judge, but... Um, but I really wish that more people would come forward because I think if you work in IT or in an internet provider or in a telephone company, you really have, um, you really have an ethical obligation to the people whose information you're handling. Um, that's the way I look at it in any case. Uh, and, and I really feel that people that don't take that obligation seriously um, really should stop and think about what they're doing. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the kind of cliche type sayings that really meant something to me throughout that whole experience was, you know, better to die on your feet than live on your knees. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to say that in an insulting way if there are people out there that have received these letters and didn't do anything about it, but 
because really what I want to do is encourage people. You know, rise up, do something. Uh, in any case, I, I made this little tiny URL thing which leads to the ACLU site. This link goes to all the documents from the case. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff you can read there. Um, you can see all the documents and see how full of black marker marks they are and how you can't really read about the case because it's all censored. Um, but it might be shocking because many people have never seen documents that are as blacked out as uh, some of these documents are. And I'm thinking maybe I can open one. Let's see. Hopefully I won't open one of the wrong ones and go to jail for 10 years. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. So this is like the declaration of one of the... I think this is the declaration of the agent, it, who brought the letter to my office. Um, and it's actually not that bad. Um, let's see if there's a better one somewhere. Mm. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong thing there. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, okay, yeah, here's a good one. Okay, so this is a typical document <laughs> from, from my case. <laughs> I thought you would... <laughs> you can't read too much of it. It's, it's like one of those... Uh, cables from WikiLeaks in that it's, it's marked secret, no foreign, you know, for no foreign people. Um, but it says here, uh, I make this declaration, blah, 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 as part of my official duties as a supervising secret agent or something at FBI headquarters. So it's from a, it's from a heavy FBI guy. I mean, a lot of the stuff in my case was from people that were like the head of the counterintelligence division at the FBI. They, they were really heavy people. And I think I blocked out a lot of what this stuff was because it, it's really scary to me uh, how like heavy and influential some of the people were. Um, so in any case, you know, where I'm going from here is uh, actually I, I started a, a not-for-profit organization um, and I intend to uh, do a little bit of hosting, a little bit of internet provider stuff uh, with a particular purpose which is that I'm hoping that I can do some further legal challenges to some of the warrantless wiretapping laws in America. Um, the you know, the company that I, that I ran was called Calix Internet Access, and so I, liked, I always liked that name, so I decided to keep it because uh, no one else was using it. So uh, I called the not-for-profit organization the Calix Institute. Um, and uh, right now it doesn't have too much up there, but it's really just a, a business plan at this point, and I'm trying to find uh, some people who might be like angel investors. Um, if, if you, can, if you can believe that anyone would, would fight this fight, I hope you can believe that, that I would uh, do it, you know, after having done this for so many years. Um, so, in any case, uh, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Um, I guess at this point I would open up the floor to questions, if anyone has any. Um, do we have anything from the Internet? We do? Cool. Um, we'll start with uh, the uh, um, questions from uh, IRC, and then we'll move on to this gentleman here, followed by um, you over there, and then we'll go backwards and forwards. Okay? Take it away. Um, I would like to start with a statement from Harpane from IRC. He would like to thank you for your talk and for, you, to use his words, having the boards to stand up. <laughs> Sumose had a question, so uh, he asked about the connection to whistleblowing sites like WikiLeaks. Do you think this mechanism is a kind of protection from the Fox uh, publishing the stuff anonymously? I'm sorry, can you please repeat just the last part of that? 
Do you think the NSLs are a mechanism to protect the, the information from getting leaked via, via WikiLeaks, for example? I, I don't think so, uh, because as far as I understand, uh, the NSLs can really only be used to get information. I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think that there's any way to use them to prevent someone from publishing or to shut down a website. Um, although I guess they could be used to pressure the internet provider hosting a site like that to kick them off. Um, that seems like a definite possibility. Okay, uh, this gentleman here. Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering um, if you're completely, if you're someone who receives a letter like that is completely gagged, what's to stop the mafia from just um, sending out orders to whoever they want to get information they want? And I suppose just to follow up, um, could this be used to help leak information? So we could just make up NSA. Um, <laughs> That second part of your question was interesting. I'd never thought of it that way. <laughs> um, I mean, the thing was, you know, I met this agent when it came to my office. Uh, but then after that, I really had no further interaction with them um, because I didn't give them anything. Uh, only my lawyer spoke to them. But I guess because of that, you know, we know that they weren't uh, mafia guys. It was apparently the real FBI. The um, Mafia generally have better suits. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's true. FBI salaries don't, don't pay for good tailoring. Uh, okay, so uh, this young lady here. Yeah, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us, really. Uh, I think what happened to you is pretty horrendous and it's quite unbelievable. And of course, it kind of sucks for you, but I guess we're all incredibly lucky that you were one of the few, many people who got this letter. And I just want to thank you for your courage and standing up. Thank you. Young lady in the house. I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you, um, were you able to challenge the fact that there was secret evidence in your case? W were you able to challenge on that at all? We fought uh, over that issue. Um, and the judge, in the end, allowed the secret evidence. Um, and were at you that, able to appeal that decision? At that something? time, we didn't choose to appeal it. Um, and some of it had to do with just burnout on my part. Some of it had to do with the fact that the attorneys I was working with have limited resources and there's, they, they can't just take on unlimited battles because if we had really gone after every single thing to the end, they couldn't have probably done anything else. And, and ACLU does a lot of stuff other than national security stuff. Um, so sadly, no, we just kind of let that one go. Um, but I, I believe the reason that the judge allowed it, at least in part, is that there are precedents that allow that and that they, uh, they tend to sort of defer to, uh, to law enforcement uh, in many cases. Sure. Okay, um, we'll take uh, this gentleman here uh, in the Mario shirt. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I basically wanted to... Um, well, ask about secret services because it seems to me very much that uh, secret services are, uh, well, one of the uh, terrible dangers to uh, democracy that we have at the moment. You cannot control them, not even the government can control them. Basically, they're kind of, uh, well, they think they're above the law and I guess uh, with so such stuff happening, they kind of, uh, that well, it works many times that they just take everything that they want. So I wanted to ask, do you have any um, idea, uh, any, um, I don't know, uh, how we, how secret uh, services should be because, well, argu arguably we might need them for some things, but how should a secret service uh, in the future act so that it can fulfill uh, its uh, job but still is controlled because we need that control. and. Yeah. 
I think that's an interesting question, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in how to run secret services, um, or you know, really, uh, I don't know that much about them other than my minor interactions with them over the years. Um, but I think we could probably all agree that there needs to be a lot more transparency, and particularly, there needs to be accountability. Um, you know, from what I saw in, in the case of national security letters, it was exposed, the facts were exposed that the FBI had been, uh, number one, lying to Congress, underreporting how much they'd been spying on people. Number two, they'd been getting information that they weren't allowed to get. Uh, and, and then they all said it was a mistake, and everyone walked away. And as, as far as I know, I don't think there's been any public announcement that anyone lost their job, was penalized, or anything. There was, there was just nothing. They said, oh, it was a mistake, I'm sorry, and then that was the end of it. You know? Well, what if I, like, you know, don't follow through with my obligations under this letter? What if I break the gag, right? Can I just say, oh, I'm sorry, it's a mistake? No, they'll put me in jail for 10 years. So I find that, you know, lack of balance a bit upsetting, personally. What do you think the reason is, if I may add that, uh, why no member of Congress has uh, appealed to, co uh, to the court for this uh, matter? Do they not have any balls or whatever? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to start insulting, you know, the fine members of the Congress. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's not a crime yet to insult the plant life on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I can't really. I would have. I would be speculating if I if I was to say why. Um, I mean, I think there is at least, you know, and I, I can't speak about any other country other than America because I just am not that well versed, but. At least in America, I think there's a very buddy-buddy kind of thing going on, and uh, they rarely uh, penalize each other. They, they seem to accept this, sorry, it was a mistake excuse uh, pretty readily, uh, whereas you know, regular people like us uh, can't ever go to court and say, sorry, it was a mistake. Um, I guess that comes back to the whole thing that, that there needs to be more accountability. Um, how to actually get from where we are now to there. I'm sorry, but I don't know. I wish I did. I Thank wish you. I did. Okay, we'll take one question from IRC and then this gentleman here, and then we should probably call time on the whole exercise. I'm, I believe uh, that, Nick, if you go downstairs to the sort of right lounge area, um, you can be mobbed and receive your adulation <laughs> in private. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. As he told and asked a question from IRC, did you just consider leaving the country? Sorry, the question? Have you just considered fleeing the United States? Had I considered that? Uh, I spent some time outside the country uh, during, during this time period, uh, at least a year, but uh, I, I had never considered just fleeing because really what the most important thing to me was to permanently get things back to the way they taught me it was in school. When they, you know... Um, you know I, I wanted to be, if they want to search for stuff, which I accept is sometimes necessary, just go to a judge, show the judge your evidence, and then you can get the stuff that you want. You know, like, I fought with, with the government for, it's almost seven years now, and if they had just gone to a judge, which would have taken them like an hour, and just shown some evidence and gotten a warrant, I would have had to have given it to them, and they, it would have been done. And they, they, I don't know how much it cost them. I do know this much, that the, the legal fees from this whole thing are, are going to have to be paid by the government to my attorneys, and it's in excess of a million dollars from what I understand. Um, so that's kind of cool, but I don't think they really care about a million dollars. That's nothing to them. To me, that's like an astronomical number, but uh, it doesn't mean much to them. But again, like, I think this sort of leads back to 
the abuses of these national security letters. I think the reason, and I'm, I'm going to just engage in speculation here, I believe that the reason they're using national security letters and not getting warrants is because they're doing massive data mining and they're doing uh, like social network diagramming and stuff like that, and they're trying to figure out who is like three, four, and five degrees away from people that are interesting. And I think they're just randomly going after people and just compiling huge amounts of data. Um, and, and that's why they didn't try to get evidence and go to a judge, because there is no evidence. That's my theory. I have no proof. But, uh, but that's kind of what it's really starting to sound like. And uh, we'll take one last question from this gentleman here. Okay. Was it legal to change the law and um, justify things done in the past and send you back to the lower court in 2007? That, I wish I had one of my attorneys with me here. I, I, I guess it must have been legal, because the government did it. <laughs> um, and uh, I think we are pretty much, we've got, we've got one minute. So uh, I think we should uh, use that to uh, give that. Make a big round of applause. I love you. So we have uh, the uh, last speaker of the evening, uh, Nicholas Merrill from, uh, wow, you must go back to the sort of like when the internet was sort of like wet behind the ears. A little bit, like, yeah. No, the days of Archer and Go, uh, Archie and Gopher and so true, on. True, you know, so true. So he's like me, he's old, he's old, the, well, old as the hills, because <laughs> I remember that stuff and loved it. So uh, this is uh, Nicholas Merrill uh, from... Uh, Calix, which is, uh, dates from the very, very, very early days of the internet, uh, and uh, he will be uh, inviting you to do probably what you do already. So, I'm not quite sure. What, uh, anyway, so uh, yes, uh, Nic Nicholas Merrill on uh, the uh, constant surveillance and intrusion into our lives. Take it away, Nicholas. Big hand, please, for Nicholas Merrill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to begin by kind of apologizing in advance because when I speak about this topic, uh, I have to think a lot. The reason for that is that I've been under a gag order from the FBI for almost seven years now. Um, and whenever I speak about this subject, which is still a new experience for me, um, I have to stop and think to make sure that I don't say anything that violates the gag order. And there's about a million different ways I could screw up. And if I do screw up and I say something I'm not supposed to say, I could do about 10 years in prison. So forgive me uh, if it seems like I'm stuck for a second. It's because I'm going down a, a laundry list of things that I'm not supposed to say. Um, so in any case, the, the subject of my speech tonight is basically to tell you a story that, uh, that happened to me um, of American's worldview. Uh, so the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. Constitution guards, you know, people, their houses, their papers, their effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. And so there's always these scenes in movies where, you know, police knock and they say, hey, where, where's your warrant? And everyone knows these rules. Um, 
So soon after September 11th, uh, the Patriot Act passes in Congress. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I've seen photos of it. It was like hundreds of pages. It was a big stack of papers. But uh, the story that, uh, that occurred was that you know, someone introduced the bill, they brought it out, and within five minutes they had a vote and it was passed. And there was no debate, there was no discussion. Uh, and and it, it was something that really deserved like weeks of, of discussion. I mean, it was a huge thing. Uh, it turned out that there was a lot of really uh, heavy-handed things in there. There was uh, something called sneak and peek searches. Uh, those are searches where someone breaks into your house when you're not there, looks, maybe takes stuff, maybe not, and then they never notify you. Uh, so that was really kind of bizarre. That made me a little... Uh, nervous. Um, then they took this really obscure thing called the National Security Letter and they modified the rules for it. And it had been used for a very specific purpose before, but uh, after they uh, modified the law, it became used for just general purposes. It had been designed for use against foreign agents, like spies and stuff like that. Uh, so it had a very narrow purpose, and then all of a sudden it was used for everything. Uh, and they also came up with something called a roving wiretap, which means that, uh, let's say you have 10 cell phones, they would just, you know, get one wiretap order for you, for Joe, whoever, you know, and then they'd be able to follow you wherever you went. Um, so, you know, one day I'm working in my office, uh, it's a normal day, I get this telephone call. Uh, the telephone, the person on the telephone says that they're with the FBI, uh, and they say they are sending someone to my office with a letter. I'm not really sure whether to take them seriously or not. I kind of half did and half didn't, but I have a lot of friends that, that do stuff like that, like call up and, and speech. Uh, some of them did so anonymously, some of them used pseudonyms, and that aspect of it will, you know, the importance of that will become obvious later on in, in the story. Um, so then September 11th uh, happens, uh, you know, that, that topic's been beaten to death, but, uh, but it sort of is important to this because uh, it sort of set the tone for me mentally in terms of uh, the offices that I worked out of uh, ended up being inside a closed military zone uh, where you had to go through military checkpoints to get inside and you had to show papers. And for me, that was actually kind of like emotionally jarring. Uh, there was weird stuff in the news, there was reports of mass roundups of Muslim men, uh, and it just started to sound like stuff I knew from history. It sounded really scary. Uh, Bush started saying that he could just grab anyone, put a hood on their head, and just drag them away, uh, just on his say-so, uh, which, you know, I found extremely alarming. Uh, and it seemed like the American public kind of had been terrorized by their own government to the point where everyone just kind of shut up and, and wasn't saying very much and, and there wasn't a ton of protest going on. I, I kind of felt a bit alone uh, in my thoughts about how alarming this seemed. Um, this seems like it's uh, a tangent, but it's sort of more background information. Um, under U.S. law, we have the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. It's about searching and seizing things. Uh, the history of it was that the British used to run America as a colony. Uh, they had a, a paper called a writ of assistance, and it was like a blanket search warrant. Um, and when you go to school in America, you learn all about King George and how he was, you know, like a heavy-handed uh, dictatorial kind of a king, and uh, that led to the American Revolution. Um, so you have, just have to understand that this all helped create my, my world view and a lot of, and so I thought maybe it was one of my friends. So I just kind of didn't think about it that much. I went back to work. But then, you know, uh, pretty soon there was a knock at the door. Um, by the way, this is an actual image of the business card that uh, this person gave me. Um, now this gets into this stuff that I'm not supposed to talk about a lot because for some reason I'm not supposed to really say basically anything about the agent that came. Uh, you know, I understand, I guess they, they're protective of the agent, uh, but I always have to call the agent the agent, because if I say the sex of the agent, that apparently is enough to send me to jail, or if I say the name of the agent, or if I say what office of the FBI the agent came from, those are all things I, I'm not supposed to talk about, so 
Uh, forgive me if I refer to the agent as it or something strange like that. Um, so the agent standing there, the agent pulls out a letter, gives the letter to me. I open the letter, I read it. Um, the letter says that I have to produce all kinds of data and information about one of Calix's clients. Um, I can't discuss exactly what they wanted uh, because of the gag order. Um, so this is an actual image of the letter, uh, but it's a you know, redacted version because if I show you the real one, then I'll go to jail for 10 years. Um, so the first thing that really leaps out is that it says that I'm prohibited from telling any person about this request. Um, I'm not supposed to mention that the FBI requested information, or I'm not supposed to talk about any of the details involving it. And it, it, it's just uh, absolute. It doesn't say, like, don't tell anyone for two weeks, or don't tell anyone until we get back to you and say you can't. It just, don't tell anyone. That's, it's just absolute. It's not signed by a judge. That was the first thing I looked for. I'm like, okay, where's the judge's signature? Where's the stamp from the court? And it's not there. So I look up at the agent, uh, and I say, prohibited from telling any person, what, like, what about my lawyer, what about my business partners, like, wh what is this? And then the agent just kind of shrugged and didn't really answer me and acted like, uh, like it had no, um, no say-so and, and was just a messenger. Uh, before I uh, really go into the story itself, I thought I'd give a little bit of background. Um, I started an internet company in 94 in New York. Um, you know, I was just out of school. Um, technically, I'd been asked to leave school. Uh, but uh, in any case, I, I was fresh out in the world. And, and I thought, hey, this is a really exciting thing. Uh, it's like uh, the Wild West. There's no supervision. There's no... Uh, you know, there's no rules. Uh, and that's kind of how it was at the beginning. And I, like most young people, wanted to change the world. Um, so, you know, being a, kind of a politically minded person, I wanted to work with alternative media. Uh, I wanted to work with activists. Uh, I wanted to do exciting things. And so I dove in and started to do that. Um, the company basically did a lot of things at the beginning and later did fewer, but, you know, a lot of it involved web hosting, uh, providing internet access, things like that. Uh, it was all based on open source technology, uh, which was a really exciting thing. Um, number one, because it made it possible to do with almost no money, and number two, you know, you could really get your hands dirty, get in, mess with code. Uh, as time went on, I realized I wasn't going to be able to keep the thing going just by working with activists. I realized that that was not really as realistic of a plan as I thought at the beginning, and I started to do more what I called straight work, just working for uh, companies. And somehow I worked my way up to where I had some pretty decent uh, corporate clients who, in a way, ended up kind of subsidizing all the work with the activists, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, some of the uh, alternative media organizations that I worked with and some of the activist groups uh, were in, engaged in like really controversial 